So, in ancient Greece, how do you separate the men from the boys? You use a crowbar. Hello everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Drunk History with Graf. This is a series in which I drink some alcohol and talk about history, starting from the Bronze Age going all the way up to present day. In the last episode, we finally finished off the long and bloody Second Punic War with the surrender of Carthage. Last episode saw Rome gather a, an astonishing amount of territory. And in this episode, we're going to have a look over one of Rome's most important acquisitions as it goes forward. Greece. Greece was a cultural entity that Rome had revered for centuries at this point. After defeating the Persians and eventually conquering them, Greek culture became extremely revered in Rome, and a lot of the Roman elite started to speak Greek, as it became the lingua franca of the day. Right, so, in the last episode, the map of the Mediterranean looked like this. Carthage had been, you know, stomped on thoroughly and reduced to this, Rome had gobbled up Iberia, and a bit of Cisalpine Gaul. Now, in the last episode, I referred to Iberia as being basically a Roman colony. However, this is actually pretty far from the truth. And although Rome had official control over this area, it would fight a bloody guerrilla war for the next hundred years against the Celtiberian tribes that didn't want to be dominated by this foreign power. Likewise, all of this territory over here, Illyria and Albania, came under the sway of Rome prior to the Second Punic War, with, with an area which Rome conquered in order to prevent piracy which had been happening in the Adriatic. And just like with Iberia, they would fight a bloody guerrilla war against the native tribes for decades to come. However, uh, despite Rome having technically won the Second Punic War, there was a huge amount of damage dealt to Italy and to Rome, uh, which would create social issues which would eventually go on to cause the fall of the Roman Republic, and even later on, the eventual stagnation of the Roman Empire. When Hannibal was rampaging up and down Italy, lots of people were displaced, lots of farmers in particular abandoned their farms and headed to the cities for protection. When the war ended, a lot of these people returned to their land to find it turned into a barren wasteland. All of the crops taken, and the fields left fallow, all of their livestock killed. And so they would choose, usually, to sell this land and move into the cities. This resulted in colossal plantations being opened up, called latifundia. And these latifundia would basically concentrate economic power in Rome into the hands of a much smaller elite. The middle class pretty much dried up from this. The small landowner disappeared. And because of the disappearance of the small landowner, slavery became a lot more prevalent. I don't usually like to talk about morality in this series, however, slavery is something I have to comment on, because slavery destroys societies. The West, having experienced this, is still going through the problems that slavery has caused, but there are a lot more pressing and immediate concerns that come with slave societies. And I'm just going to put up a slide here from one of my favourite YouTube historians called What If Altist. And he is an inspiration for a lot of what I do on the channel, so if you haven't checked him out, please do. He lays it out a lot more eloquently than I ever could. But as you can see, slavery is extremely toxic for a civilization. And this is a problem that Rome runs into, and I will explain more in later episodes. So, now on to Greece. A lot of time has passed since we last looked at this side of the world, so I'm gonna have to quickly go over the major powers again. The major three powers are Antigonid Macedon, the Seleucid Empire, and Ptolemaic Egypt, taking up these three areas. However, in the last 200 years, there have been some breakaways. Most notably in Anatolia, there are two main kingdoms that have split off from the Seleucids. Uh, this one here, Pergamon, is going to become very important later, and this one here, Bithynia, which is where Hannibal ended up before he was killed. In mainland Greece, Macedon lost a lot of territory to the new Greek leagues that were popping up. This area here is controlled by a federation of Greek states called the Aetolian League, which are a particularly anti-Macedonian federation who basically chose to fight against encroaching Macedonian influence in Greece. Then down here in the Peloponnese, there's the Achaean League, named after the initial name that the Greeks had in Homer's Epics. The Achaean League is a federation of city-states 
much like the Aetolian League, however the Achaeans are a lot more favourable towards Macedon, likely due to not actually having a border with them to guard against. You also had the traditional hegemons of Greece, Athens and Sparta, but they were much, much diminished from their previous states, for reasons that I've already explained. Sparta at this point is a shell of its former self, and Athens has supreme cultural dominance over Greece, but has virtually no political or military clout. Now, there is a lot of animosity in the air between Macedon and Rome, because during the Second Punic War, Macedon had attempted to build an alliance with the Carthaginians to fuck over Rome, and Rome is still kind of butthurt about that. Not butthurt enough to immediately go to war with them, but to be waiting for an excuse to do so. And this opportunity presents itself in 200 BC. Now in the years before this, the Ptolemaic Kingdom had been declining quite significantly. Their economy had been slowly declining, and they had been suffering a number of native revolts against the Greek rule. And so, the Seleucids and the Antigonid Macedonians decided they were going to team up to fuck over Egypt. And so, the Seleucids invade the Ptolemaic-held Levant, taking Syria and attempting to take Israel as well. Meanwhile, Macedon moves down and takes all of the islands that are under Ptolemaic control. Rome is particularly unhappy with this, as any disturbance in the region is, well, it's basically an excuse to get back at the Macedonians, really. So Rome sends diplomatic envoys to its allies in Pergamon and in the Aetolian League, and they start up another war. Rome initially intended to join this war with its allies, but a vote by the Popular Assembly of Rome goes against joining the war, as Rome is still really tired from the Punic Wars. However, a few speeches by the new Roman consuls quickly changed this opinion, as they compared the emergence of the more powerful Macedon to the rise of Carthage, a new threat that could potentially attack Rome. So Rome starts landing ships and armies in Epirus, which they had conquered, alongside Illyria. Initially, the war goes quite well, and the king of Macedon, Philip V, is forced out, and he is pushed southwards into the Aetolian League's territory, where they continue to fight him. Eventually, the main Roman army comes into contact with Philip's main army, at a place called Sinocephaly. Sinocephaly is in many ways an archetypal battle. This is a, a pattern that you would see in many battles later in history, in which neither side were fully aware of the other's presence, and their vanguard of skirmishers encountered one another. Not knowing that the entire other army was there, they would call for support from their main army, and the battle would escalate from there. The Roman Manipular Legions had been designed to counter the ordinary Greek-style phalanx, which was the technique that was employed by most areas around the Mediterranean at this point, including the Celtiberians and other Italic peoples. This was the technique that the Carthaginians had used, and it would look something like this from this screenshot of 300. But now that they were fighting the Hellenistic kingdoms, now they were fighting against the descendants of Alexander, who utilised the Macedonian phalanx, this fucking beast. So looking at this range advantage that the Macedonians have, you'd think the Romans would be creamed, right? But wrong. The phalanxes have certain advantages over the legions, but they also have certain very big disadvantages. The main advantage they have is that they're extremely strong, but their disadvantage is that they are very inflexible, whereas the legions had been designed specifically for flexibility. Some of the most influential people in the Roman army were the Centurions, or Centurions as we know them now, and you can tell by just the cultural impact that that word has how much more we know of them than, say, the the praetors or the legates everyone knows what a centurion is additionally the romans were had built their fighting around close range whereas the macedonians had built theirs around a much longer range so they had their long sarissa spears out but what the romans would tend to do was they would use their shields angle them up to push the spear out of the way and then duck underneath it once they had done this, they could get right in close and stab the fuck out of the considerably less well-armoured phalangists. Additionally, the Romans were also much better trained and disciplined than the Greeks. 
the Greek phalanx was built upon the presupposition that the people who were doing it wouldn't entirely know what they were doing. It was designed simply so that you would stand in a line and lock shields together. Whereas the Roman Manipula Legion was much, much, much more complex. A significant advantage that the Romans held over the Greeks was that the Greek lines were very, very solid and steady, and combat was very, very tiring. Once you had a line in place, it would be very difficult to move it, especially to move the people in it. The Roman Manipula Legion had been designed specifically so that the people at the front line could quickly swap with the ones behind it. So that once the people at the front got tired, they could swap with the much more well-prepared lines behind them. This gave them much more staying power than the phalanx. Sinocephaly was a very much a slow burn of a battle. Initially, it started with the left wing of Rome fighting against the right wing of Macedon, with the opposite number just try, rushing to try and get into battle in time. The Romans were going very much on the offensive, but the Greek line was holding steady. However, the Roman right flank got into position much quicker than the Greek left, which meant that while the Romans were fully formed up in order, the phalangists of Macedon were not in proper rank. And that's a very important thing about the phalanx, is that if it's not in perf it's, if it's not formed up properly, it's virtually useless. Because of how unwieldy the Sarissa spear is, a single phalangist is extremely vulnerable. On the other hand, a legionary is, m because his shield covers his entire body, and because he uses a much shorter and more practical sword, is a lot less vulnerable. Not that that matters in this case, because the Romans were fully formed up. The much more well-formed Roman ranks on the right flank pushed through the Macedonian left, pushing them back, breaking them. As this happens, several Roman centurions break off their maniples and send them off to support the left flank, where they come in behind the Macedonians. And although the Macedonians seem to be winning initially on that flank, suddenly they have enemies behind them. And while the Roman legion is drilled and disciplined so perhaps they'd be able to turn around, a phalanx is useless if it is not looking in the direction of the enemy, which means that once it's encircled, it's all over. With the Battle of Sinocephaly over, Macedon is defeated, and they, at this point, they basically get made into Rome's bitch. They get forced into signing a bunch of humiliating treaties, disbanding their navy, and tying their foreign policy to Rome's. So, Macedon essentially becomes a Roman puppet state. 194 comes around, and Rome figures that it has achieved victory against the forces that it wanted to defeat. It completely pulls its troops out. This is potentially a mistake, because Although they have made peace, the Aetolian League is still not happy with the state of Macedon. They want it stomped on harder, so they send a, a message to the Seleucid Empire and invite them to invade. So the Seleucid Empire, which at this point is starting to see itself as the liberator of all Greeks from the foreign Romans, invades Greece and attempts to invade Macedon. However, there is some serious problems with the Seleucid Empire generally. And that is, because they're based in Syria and Persia, they are s really the mainland Greeks see them as being foreign. And likewise, because they treat all non-Greeks within the empire so badly, a lot of the native peoples consider them to be foreign because they're Greek. So really, the Seleucid monarchy doesn't have many friends. How sad. So the Seleucid army under Antiochus III starts going all around Greece, sending out messages to various city-states asking for their support. But soon enough, Roman ships appear here and cut them off from their supply lines. The Seleucids realize they have to rush back to secure their supplies and destroy the Roman army that stands between them. However, they find themselves at a familiar place. They realize that the Romans are still marching towards them to just try and destroy their army. So they go and they encamp at Thermopylae, the same place that the Spartans and the Greek League had defeated the Achaemenid Persians at before. This is pretty much because the Seleucids are trying to regain their image as being Greeks. Beforehand, they before they did this, they also stopped off at the battlefield of Sinocephaly to bury the bones of the war dead as a way of trying to show how Greek they are. And similarly, here they're basically just LARPing as King Leonidas and more or less the same thing happens. 
Unlike the previous time, the Seleucids decide to man the passes, but the goat paths that the Persians had used before. However, the Roman forces under Cato the Elder push through these forces and end up surrounding them anyway. After having destroyed this army, the Romans chase Antiochus III across the Aegean Sea, and they find themselves in Anatolia, where they win the Battle of Magnesia about here. Now, the Seleucids are strong enough and powerful enough that they could potentially raise another army. However, because they're so disliked by their subject peoples, they decide not to do this and they accept a treaty, cutting off their territory west of the Taurus Mountains. Most of this territory ends up going to Pergamon. Now, for the next decade, Greece is fairly peaceful, until 172 when Philip V dies. Now there is a succession dispute in Macedon between two main claimants to the throne. One of them is very pro-Rome, the other one is this guy, Perseus. Perseus kills the pro-Roman heir to the throne and inherits the kingdom himself. He then starts sending diplomatic envoys to all over Greece to try and assure his legitimacy so that no one was going to intervene in this. However, one kingdom did not get asked about this, and that was Pergamon. And Pergamon was pissed, especially as Pergamon was quite worried about growing Macedonian power and influence and didn't want to be conquered by them. So Pergamon sends a messenger to their ally, Rome. The messenger tells the Roman Senate, Oh, I'm, I'm so glad I got here in time. I'm glad I got here before Perseus's phalanxes got here, because he's going to fucking invade Italy. Now, this is basically complete bullshit, and the Romans are not entirely convinced by it, but they're paranoid after having suffered in the Second Punic War, and so they don't really want to risk leaving a potential threat like this. At the same time, the Seleucid Empire attempts to invade Egypt. The Seleucid king meets up with the Roman proconsul Gaius Popilius Laenus, and they get to negotiating about this to try and basically to stop the invasion happening, because Rome can likes its stability, particularly with regards to Egypt, which is now actually exporting a decent amount of grain to Rome. However, the negotiations don't really go all that well, and the Seleucid king is about to walk out. Uh, but then, Gaius pulls out a stick, and he draws a circle around the Seleucid king, and basically says, you're gonna give me something to tell to the Senate before you leave this fucking room. And he is completely cowed by this, and he says, alright, invasion's off, I'm going home. Meanwhile, the Roman forces land in Macedon, and completely butcher Perseus' armies. Rome at this point is so unhappy with how much they've had to intervene in Macedon that they decide that they're going to just break it apart and they establish four separate republics, each of which are basically puppet states of Rome. They're not allowed to trade with one another. The heads of state of these four republics are not allowed to intermarry to ensure that they can never get back together. Now, for the next decade and a half, once again, Greece is fairly peaceful until this guy here, Andriscos, just an ordinary guy, pretty much decides that he's going to try and revive Macedon. So he starts running around telling anyone who will listen to him that he's actually the son of Perseus. And eventually, in Thrace, the Thracians decide that they're going to give him an army. And he goes and he reconquers Macedon and declares himself the king of the new Macedonian Empire. Rome is not having any of that shit and they immediately pour troops into Greece, conquer the area, kill Andriscos, and end the independence of Macedon forever. Instead of creating independent puppet states, Rome entirely absorbs the area, as well as the Aetolian League, into the new Roman province of Macedon. Meanwhile, things are happening back west. Remember where we left Carthage? Well, Carthage was continuing to be a worry for the Romans. It had not yet rebuilt its military, it couldn't really do that, given the Roman restrictions, but its economy was starting to go way back up, and so a lot of people considered it to be a resurgent threat. By far and away the most famous of these Romans is the guy who was leading the charge around the paths at the Battle of Thermopylae II Electric Boogaloo, Cato the Elder, also known as Cato the Censor. And his most sort of famous thing that he ever did was the fact that every single speech that he used ended with the words 
Ceterum autem Kenseo Carthaginum esse delendam, often just shortened to Carthago delenda est, which means, furthermore, I'm of the opinion that Carthage should be destroyed, or just Carthage should be destroyed. And he would do this at the end of every single speech, no matter what it was on. Speech about economics? Carthage should be destroyed. Discussion of how they were going to build infrastructure? Carthage should be destroyed. Where are they going to send the new legion? Carthage should be destroyed. And he'd do this at the end of every single speech. It pretty much became the Epstein didn't kill himself of the ancient world. The treaty that Rome had foisted upon the Carthaginians at the end of the Second Punic War was seriously fucking them over. They were not allowed to declare war without Rome's permission. Similarly, they were not allowed to mobilize troops without Rome's permission. So Rome's ally, Massinissa, the Numidian prince who defected to them in the Second Punic War, would repeatedly do raids against Carthaginian territory. And whenever the Carthaginians appealed to Rome to be allowed to retaliate against them, the Romans denied them this. So repeatedly they would be raided and raided by the Numidians, and they would not be allowed to retaliate. Eventually, the Carthaginians completely lost their shit and decided, fuck it, fuck the treaty, we're doing something, we're not just going to sit here and take it. So they mobilized themselves a small army, sent it against Massinissa, and it got fucked. And this violation of the treaty pretty much gave the anti-Carthaginian faction in the Roman Senate the excuse it needed to declare war and destroy Carthage. So the Roman legions landed on African shores once again and prepared to take the city. The Carthaginians, realizing that the time for bargaining is long over, drew up their forces and prepared to defend. They held out for three years until eventually the Romans managed to exploit a breach in the wall and the Roman troops rushed through the city, killing everyone they encountered, or capturing them and having them sold into slavery. When it was done, the Romans salted the fields so that nothing would ever grow there again, destroyed every building, and with that, Carthage had been entirely destroyed. The area where Carthage had once been got absorbed into the new Roman province of Africa. While all this is going on with the Carthaginians in the west, the Achaean League down here is starting to misbehave a little bit. For a very long time, the Achaean League has wanted to incorporate Sparta into it, which would be a great boon to their legitimacy. So, in the year 146, they attempt to conquer Sparta. However, to their surprise, Rome intervenes on behalf of Sparta. They send diplomatic envoys to the Achaeans, demanding that they stop, that they relinquish their claims on Sparta, and when they don't, Rome invades, conquers the entire area, and incorporates it into the province of Macedon. And with that, mainland Greek independence has been squashed and entirely absorbed by Rome. It should be noted, however, that Greek culture was not destroyed by this. Rome quite heavily revered and respected the Greeks. As I mentioned in the beginning of this episode, most of the Roman elite spoke Greek as either a first or second language because it was so important to them. After this, the Greek religion would be so heavily incorporated into the Roman religion that the majority of the differences that the Roman religion had from the Greek religion would slowly dissipate, and almost every single Roman god could be considered analogous to a Greek god. It was said that although Rome had militarily conquered Greece, Greece had culturally conquered Rome, and even to the dying days of the empire, it would remain split between a majority Latin-speaking and majority Greek-speaking populations. And that is going to conclude what has been so far, I think, our longest drunk history episode. So, at the end of this episode, the map looks like this, with Rome having swallowed a truly humongous amount of territory. All of Carthage and all of their territory have been eaten by Rome, all of the Maghreb, pretty much, as well as Greece and Illyria. Rome is now pretty much a truly Mediterranean Empire. In the next episode, I'm going to hopefully talk about some of the crises that Rome faced in the coming years, such as slave revolts, dictatorship, and the problems that eventually would lead to Kaiser. This has been Graf. I will see you next time. Thank you very much.